Now, uh, our, our next speaker uh, was born in Vietnam, uh, is presently a French citizen, is the general secretary of the French part of the TSHR, um, is the chairperson of the European TSHR. Um, she's lectured in many countries, and uh, she's also publishing in many countries, and I think in many languages as well, right? And um, I think if yesterday was a preview last night of what's coming today, <laughs> she's also going to challenge the way we think about philosophy. Kim Jo. I'm going, I'm not going to discover my talk as the Queen of England discovered her speech. Huh? <laughs> I assure you I have written it. Well, first of all, many thanks to the organizers of this conference to invite me to share with you some of my thinking. I appreciate very much because it is the starting point of cooperation and sharing. Some of you have come to Paris for our 37th European Congress. And so it is just another step, and there will be more and more in the future, I trust. I would like to ask you not to panic when some of the slides will appear. It sounds very complex, but if we use the eye of simplicity, as our friend Johanna said last night, the Buddhic simplicity, we can see very, very quickly. And I am not going to comment in details, because you will find it in every encyclopedia of today. You just click on the name, you know everything about the person. So I am not going to say many words, just to make a kind of bird's eye view on it, so that we could see a global view of this context when Madame Blavatsky was born, grew up, and brought to us this revival of all the ancient wisdom. And then the next step is that how to speculate, to see next step, what can happen. We will not say what will happen, we ca what can happen, just because what will happen will depend upon what we are doing today. So I will insist upon what I would think, would think and would tend to present to you what we would do in order to mold the future, to have this, to receive correctly the heritage of wisdom revived by Blavatsky and all the others. So first, don't panic when it appears on the as a preamble, I would say there are two questions that we have to meet, the two speakers, Jean and myself. The first is that what should be the position and role of the Theosophical Movement concerning philosophy 100 years from now? Oof, what a challenge. I read, I read this question 24 times, at least. I said, what does the questioner want to say and want to know? And to this question, I think that there is a need to make a survey on the historical context of HPB's time and some observation about the evolution of this context from this time onward until now before trying to anticipate on what should be 100 years from now. Do you agree? It is too late, you have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it could go now. <laughs> so then, <clears throat> <coughs> 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 
Don't panic. You can click on every name of this in every encyclopedia to know all everything about this. I am not a, a teacher of philosophy. I am not a philosopher. I just want to understand. So, to this slide, let me give some remark. And let me not mix up with the number of the slides and the number of comments. This context showed us that the concept or the theory or the hypothesis or the belief that all is one does not come, didn't come with theosophy in the 19th century. It starts a long time ago and with, before this, we have all the names we have known by studying philosophy and by studying theosophy. It started with Parmenides, with the Eleatic philosophy. We have a Greek member here. We have a short talk before this, meaning that according to this school, the, the principle of unity of all things was already shared among the philosophers at that time. And then it says that being, the quality, the being, is one and unique, and it is continuous, invisible, indivisible, and all that there is or ever will be. This philosophy says that all is one. From this concept of being, Parmenides went on saying that all claims of change of non-being are illogical, meaning not only being is one, but there is no movement. We will see later on with, um, with uh, Plato. So you see Socrates is a name which is, who, who is very, very known in our circle. We know Socrates through the purification of the expression of language, meaning logos. At the time of Socrates, there were sophists arguing that and this, the contrary, the contrary, the contrary, and it, it is endless. So Socrates proposed a purification until all arguments vanish, meaning that it is the technique of dialogue later on called maiotic, meaning the art of giving birth to new ideas. So this is, but the second point which defined Socrates is also, he emphasized upon one very important thing. He said that there is a tremendous human resistance to self-reflection. There's a kind of resistance. We don't want to reflect on ourselves. We want to reflect on concepts ideas, theories, but on ourselves we resist. And because he pinpointed out this weakness of the human soul, he was condemned to drink the hemlock. And this is the main reason he explained later on. But, well, never mind, he drank it. And he gave us an excellent description of how death comes little by little and takes hold of the physical body. It is absolutely marvelous, wonderful. Everyone should read it to go to the core of the mastery of the soul of this man. Up to the end of his life, he is the master of himself. Socrates said also, this is also one of the main points of his teaching, that the unexamined life is not worth living. Meaning that all of us, if we pretend, to be, we pretend to be human, we must think, reflect on ourselves. Later comes Plato. Plato started to study philosophy with Parmenides, but then he uh, uh, met with uh, Socrates and he changed the direction to this. Changing a person, he does not change really the, the, the direction. But what Plato um, brings into philosophy is this 
spirit of independent inquiry. I have read somewhere that all the Western philosophies are just footnotes of Plato. Johanna agree with me, I'm very glad that he, she gave me the testify, well, testified to that. So then, Plato is really a great thinker, not only of philosophy, but I would say about also esoteric science. He gave quite a lot of reflection about space, time, etc. Now we nowadays, we melted the two notions together. Nobody will talk today about time and space, but now it is a continuum of time, space. Good for us. But at the time of Plato, when asked about time, he gave a very poetic definition. He said, what is time? Time is just eternity in movement. Was it wonderful? Eternity in movement. And it completed completely what his predecessor said, being is one, there's no movement. Of course there's no movement. Where to go? This is just one. But there is a movement of eternity on itself. It gives time. <clears throat> when we are interested in philosophy, one cannot exclude poetry, because the two are linked together. Now, I'm not going to go further with Plato, except it's just one thing. According to him, justice exists in the individual when the three elements of the soul, the intellect, and emotion, and desire act in harmony with each other. Meaning that there cannot be justice, justice if the two, three elements are conflicting, competing to each other. They should be in harmony so that they, should, they could bring about the sense of justice. Moving further, Aristotle, at that time, you all know about all the story of the Academy and the Lyceum. Aristotle holds with Plato that life of, of virtues is rewarding for the virtuous as well as beneficial for the community. This is what we study. We study theosophy and philosophy and science and etc. not for the benefit of ourselves, but for the benefit of all. Aristotle ends up agreeing with, agreeing with Plato that the life of the intellect is the most rewarding in existence though he was more realistic than Plato in suggesting that it is important for all of us, in suggesting that a life would also contain the goods of material prosperity and close friendship. You see that is a little bit out because with Plato very strict and Aristotle came to the thing and he said, well, you can enjoy life a little bit more, have close friends, etc., but still remain in the right way of philosophical thinker. Came after that the Stoics. You know the Stoics. It is a kind of distortion now. We think that they are very stiff, etc., but not, not so, not so. They just rejected passion together as a basis for deciding what is good or bad, meaning when we think and we try to judge and discern, passion should not come in, because otherwise it will be messed up. I cannot think. Now, the Stoics also give the conviction that all human beings share the capacity to reason. This is very important. There is not an elite knowing how to think. The whole humanity is capable of this meaning that our task as a student of theosophy, we have the duty to awaken this, because it is a possibility in everyone. Perhaps the most important legacy of Stoicism, however, is this conviction that all human beings share the capacity of re to reason, and also the, Stoic the Stoicists 
uh, believe a fundamental equity, meaning all of us are equal. It is not you are more courageous, you are more virtue, all is equal in potentiality. Now this gives this implication that there is a universal moral law which all people are capable of appreciating because we are equal, people are capable of reasoning. This universal law is accessible to everyone. This is the, the doctrine of the Stoics. Came later the Epicurean. There's also a distortion of that. The, this school um, stipulate a way to do uh, in life is to eliminate all but the simplest wants, meaning that everyone has needs, but we are multiplying our needs. Huh? One day, another, another, another. It is endless. But for this doctrine of Epicurean, we can have the right to have the needs, but the simplest one, meaning a roof, food, growth, and simplicity is the, their word. Now it is distorted in such a way that afterwards they think that it is just enjoying life, but it is not that. Now from that on, you see the development of these positions, including the ethics, was dramatically affected by the spreading from the Middle East of a new religion at that time, which is Christianity, what that was rooted in a Jewish conception of ethics as strict obedience to a divine authority. This, this belief came from that. Onward now, the notion of ethics melted with Christian morality. That is the moral context at HBB's birth when she was re received this incarnation this is this context. As to philosophy, we go a little bit forward. Probably you will find, no, I want to, yeah, I want to come back to the East later on. This is the, because of the chronological thing. So coming to the philosophical background, it is a little bit, complex because the human mind likes to split things more and more. Eh? And so don't panic. Just look at the date. And you will see that it is very interesting that before HPB's birth, the great Emmanuel Kant was this, has dispensed his critique de la raison pure. It is a masterpiece. And Kant at that time believed that ideas, the raw matter of knowledge, must somehow be due to realities existing independently of human mind, from human mind. But he held that such things in themselves must remain forever unknown. It is, it is difficult, huh? meaning the, the core of the nature, the true nature of everything is unknown and forever. So human knowledge cannot reach to them the reality of the nature of things because knowledge can only arise in the course of synthesizing the ideas of senses. Now, HPB was born the same year of Hegel's death. You know, Hegel is the, the father of the dialectic movement. It is at that time, it is just idealistic, meaning that there are movement of ideas and it moved on and it kind of evolves in such a way to, to take another step, refine, etc. But it will uh, kidnapped, it will be kidnapped later by the thinkers coming later. The TS was formally founded two years after John Stuart Mill, the pop of utilitarianism, no, utilitarianism. When he died, then TS formally found two years after. The secret doctrine was released two years before Karl Marx, the theoretician of the doctrine of communist, died. All this all together, you see the, the social atmosphere and, and the mind at that moment. And then, 
if I shock some do- someone, I also quote, Jiddu Krishnamurti was born the same year of Friedrich Engels' death. And Engels, who is it? Nobody, nobody cannot say, I don't know this name. Huh? Engels is one of the trinity of communism. Uh, the conceptor is Marx, the seller is Engels, and the buyer is Lenin. <laughs> and Lenin bought the, the doctrine, sell it all over the country, and you know where is the result. We have seen all, us, all of us here have witnessed the result of this doctrine. Now, <clears throat> the positivism of Auguste Comte, the French uh, positivist, can be summarized, you see, in the whole thing there. You can see Auguste Comte. This is the, the father, the pop of this positivism. Can be summarized as the theory that theology and mathematics, metaphysics, are earlier imperfect modes of knowledge, and that positive knowledge is based on natural phenomena and their properties and relations as verified by empirical sciences. Meaning that with Kant, it should be empiritic, empirical because you have to measure, you have to prove, you have etc. And this doctrine has developed into what is a catastrophe for the, for the thought afterwards. It is called logical positivism by a group of materialistic philosophers who gathered into the so-called Vienna Circle. The Vienna Circle existed in, in the 20s. And well, happily, this group now is dissolved. But in 19, 1929, their work ended up to, 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 I quote, a philosophy to end all philosophies, meaning it crashed against the wall of absurdity. They think about something, they discuss, they analyze this, and finally they concluded that it should be a philosophy to finish all the philosophies. It, is, it means that you have a kind of shop, you sell all the thing and you don't renew anyone and you close the, the business. Huh? They have closed their own business. Well, personally, <laughs> I will add, such is the logical way of ending for a materialistic trend of thinking. We think we, we, and always as a kind of hamster in the cage, huh? and finish, yes, finishing up to the, to the wall, ending the wall. The wall is our limitation, because those people, highly intellectual, but they dare not going out of their circle. So it turns into the hamster in the cage, and finally die out. Eventually, this group, the Vienna Club, uh, is dissolved because of the onset of the war, World War II. So they dis- dis- dispatched in the United States, in the UK, etc. In the UK now, there is this great name of Bertrand Russell. Russell is an outstanding thinker, mathematician, logician, philosopher. He commented the work of Einstein on a later theory of relativity. It is very uh, a big pity that the emotional life of uh, Bertrand Russell has uh, um, influenced so much his uh, powerful work of his mind. So somewhere it has been interrupted somewhere. So history will remember him not like a philosopher, a a big name, but a a writer, a, a, a very fine writer. So then it is just to show you the context of secret doctrine, Blavatsky, etc. at that time. Now, it is from the West. We can see also at that time, why is it that I am taking this later on? Because you see this is the background when all what is T.S., Theosophy, Blavatsky, Secret Doctrine, came into the knowledge of the public. 
after that, the public became acquainted with theosophy, and they turned to the East to know a little bit better. This is why I do it later than the other one, because chronologically, in the historical side, this is, we should come first. But historically, in the mind of theosophy people, acquainted with theosophy, it came later than the context. So all of this you know, right? I'm not going to say much about it. You know big names there. You have the Vedas, and then after the Veda, the end of the Veda, Vedanta, and then all the summary, the compendium of all the knowledge of the Veda in Upanishad, and lodged in also the six Dashana, the six Dashana of India. And then in this context also, a great figure of history uh, came, it is Gautama the Buddha. And later on, you have Naharjuna, the unsurpassable thinker of all time so far. Now it is, it is here, it is India. Almost at the same time, you have in China what we call I Ching, but it is Yi King, meaning the book of mutation and change. The Yi is meaning change and, and move, on the movement. Huh? And Dao Te King is just the Mandarin way of saying, I am lost because they write everything in Mandarin. I have studied in the form Tao Te King. Now, you go into an encyclopedia, any book, you find Dao De Jing. <laughs> and same for Lao Tzu. Uh, I have known Lao Tzu. It is another, which is the pronunciation is quite, Zhuang Zhu, the same. It's the Zhuang Zhu, and it is now Zhuang Zi. Confucius was saved by it, and Man Zi is Man Xus. It is the moralist of all time, if of ancient China. It is just to remind you that all this have been imported thanks to the current of theosophy, because the West start to be awakened. Ah, we are not alone on the market of philosophy. Let us find a little bit more. And at that time, the intellectual first came to know, because they translate, they import all things. Okay? Finished? Finished. Slide five, yes. So we can see that the background of thinking, philosophy and ethics at the moment when theosophical the society was formed and the time of Madame Blavatsky's existence on Earth. SPB brought in her Opus Magnum, The Secret Doctrine, in 1888, when the human mind was in the materialistic trend, meaning a crash of logics in the sterile absurdity. Philosophy ending at no philosophy, and then a pretending so-called dialectics based on materialism, ending also in an intellectual deadlock. Indeed, materialism at that time was not only rampant, it was already inlaid in the mind of a part of humanity. And still today, undoubtedly, materialism is well alive, like weeds not uprooted from the past. Consumerism has shifted to this part of the world, we call the communist world, in which people used to be made believe that they were the most happy and the most lucky ones on the planet. There are museums now showing the glorious period of time, the most happy people on Earth, yeah? in Petersburg. Hmm? What to do? Consumerism has shifted to this part of the world, and then now it is eaten up also, this part of the world. They have imported what we have done as a mistake. But now, in our days, more serious, there's a plague raging over the planet at present. East, west, north, south. It is called the global greed. Everybody wants more, more, and more. This is the motto of this greedy world. 
Now, 100 years more have passed since Secret Doctrine has post was first published, ever since humanity survived two world wars, Soviet gulags, barbarian treatments by recurrent dictators on the planet. And meanwhile, several generations of students have propped into the profound teachings revived by HPB. Another one. And we are now to think about the 100 year to come, years to now to come. No one can predict the position of the theosophical movement, movement from 100 years from now. Nevertheless, one thing is sure. The future can be built up from constant molding the present. Here now, we are molding the present with our action. Now, avoiding speculation, I would like to prompt us to look at the present situation. No doubt, we are living still in this context, hanging on, meaning that when we share theosophy, the teaching with others, we have to be aware not to fall back into this trend of this time. I go very quickly. Huh? Now, the influence of Jido Krishnamurti's thinking has not as yet pervaded the majority of the student's mind. Not yet, but it is starting. So let us hope that this, this kind of possibility of refutation in the future to make the thinking alive and always fresh. I think that to remold, to mold the, the thinking of today in order to prepare the future, I have a few points, I think seven, to propose. Number one, the doctrine of theosophy was given to humanity not for the sake of intellectual satisfaction. Of course, when we found something uplifting, we are brief in this kind of freshness, and we are very, very happy. But it is not for the sake of this that theosophy was given. The three aspects of the teachings encompasses ethics, superior knowledge, meaning the whole, theosophy, science, and spirituality. Ethics, superior knowledge, and occult training demand each a minimum of sacrifice. This is the key word. Number two. While studying and serving, students would learn not to continue to fall back to this positivist mode of a sort, meaning just giving out and without thinking back what is there to be true, meaning not only proclaiming, but also testing the teaching by learning to question soundly. Number three, one shouldn't try to convert anyone just because our action is to remold our thinking, not to convert, but to remold the thinking. Number four, while discussing about the doctrine, students would keep uncertainty in the mind. Insecurity is grace. This would prevent from slipping to the trap of fanaticism. Fanaticism, fanaticism. One may lead when my may learn to be aware that asserting a doctrine may just be identical to asserting oneself. Be careful, because if we do this, we pretend to teach, and our ego is boosting, we are doing the reverse of what we are asked to do. Okay? April is happy with what I say, so. Number five, uh, students would try to think by themselves. Goodness, when are we going to do this? Try to do, to think by ourselves. Using reason to move beyond reason by learning refutation. We believe that, but what is wrong? We have to find out and refute. And in the end, we are sure that this is true by refutation. Number six, while tackling abstract concepts, Students should try to use imaginative faculty to conceive. Example, conceive of unity by expansion in space and infinite time, HPB diagram. When you start the diagram with this sentence, 
what to do if we don't have this imaginative faculty, faculty of conceiving. Number seven. Since knowledge proceeds through elimination of errors and through refutation of hypotheses, one should dare to formulate, dare to formulate one's own hypothesis and dare to throw it away when it cannot be proven and move on, move on. Intelligence and intuition are two superior faculties to be used for moving onward and forward. This I refer to the mantra of the Diamond Sutra ending with gate gate, gate para gate, para sam gate, bodhisvaha. Move on, move on, up to the other shore. Very short. As to the second question, how can we reawaken theosophy with, within dogmatic philosophy? You see, I, I, am, I am attempted to say that no one would go to chase the bear in its den. We're not to provoke those people. <laughs> but is there any solution? A tentative answer was given in the reminder three, meaning never try to convert anyone, but instead, by working on one's own mind, that is to reshape and remold the collective mind. Now coming to the epilogue, which is the ending of my sharing now. By using reason and through refutation, the mind can mature, and so doing, its movement is upward. Such is the dialectic of nature, infallible due to the universal evolutionary process. This is the natural dialectic. Whatever you want or you can do, nature is moving on in this evolutionary mode. Don't have to apply dialectic on it. It is the dialectic of nature. Focusing our aim in cooperation with the incessant movement seems to be the action to fulfill right now. This action of cooperation is overarched by a paradox. Indeed, much and yet little could be done. Little because it would appear to be the least one one could do in participation. Very little we can do. But because it is much because action achieved towards this direction is tremendous in quantity and revolutionary in quality. The revolutionary aspect resides in the fact that the human mind, endowed with intuition, is now able to act on itself to bring about a drastic change of its own content. The mind can change its own content. It can then discover its capacity to reach infinity. To reach infinity. The mind is not what we think to be. The mind has a capacity to reach infinity, which is its own true nature, infinity itself. It matters little that infinity is called elsewhere emptiness. This is just a question of technical terminologies. Now from the beginning, our object is the amelioration of the condition of man. Therefore, I quote, the only object to be striven for is the amelioration of the condition of man by the spread of truth suited to the various stages of his development and that of the country he inhabits and belongs to. Truth has no earmark and does not suffer from the name under which it is promulgated. If said object is attained, it is from Mahatma Letters, you have the reference. In a way, one knows all about this. I am repeating. What I am saying here is not totally true, not exhaustive. So you know, I know. So everyone knows. Hmm? If not, everyone feels about that. 
Now remain one question. Only one question remains. Why one does not do what is needed to be done? <laughs> you may ask me back. Why okay? We know why. You know. Each one of us know why. Why we don't do what is it needed to be done? You, say, you know why? Now how to do? You say. My answer is, just do it. Thank you.